Section two, the long one. So, I'm guessing this one's gonna be like two hours. Lovely. Alrighty. State that living organisms are made of cells. All living things are made out of cells. Now, there is a hierarchy. Um, you know, atoms make molecules, molecules make macromolecules. Organelles, many organelles together make a cell, right? Now, many cells working together um, form a tissue. Many different types of tissues together make an organ. Many different types of organs together working together for one outcome is an organ system. And many organ systems together makes an organism, okay? Now, just a point to note, um, the cells to be for the cells to become a tissue, they all have to be uh, similar cells. So many similar cells working together make a tissue. Many different types of tissues working together make an organ, and organism, and organ system, and so forth and so on. So then we get to the uh, plant versus animal cells. This is your typical plant and animal cell structure. Please note. The shape is irrelevant. An animal cell can be square and a plant cell can be circular. They just like to show it this way. So now both cells have a nucleus, both cells have cytoplasm, both cells have membrane. Um, but the plant cell has a little bit extra. They have chloroplast, a permanent vacuole, and a cell wall. So the lower level, you need to be able to identify these cells. At the higher level, you need to be able to uh, state their function. And they really like to test on the function. So there is a table to help you, one and two. And please note, if you are asked to say the difference, you have to talk about both. OK? So when asked about the difference, you have to talk about both. So living things. So you can be asked to look at a picture of it under a microscope and say what it does. You can be asked to compare one and two. All right. Then we get to uh, specialized cells. There are certain cells that have very specific jobs, and they are built to do these jobs. So it's a structure versus function uh, topic. This is a wrench. It's not a cell. Don't get confused. Now, it is built or designed so its structure has something to do with its job. Um, its structure is long handle, a shaped head, and it's made out of hard metal. And that's because its function is to tighten and loosen knots and bolts. If this wrench was made out of Play-Doh, it will not be able to do its job. So one of the specialized cells that we have are uh, red blood cells or erythrocytes. And their structure is a biconcave disc, so it has two dips. Concave means dip. They are very small, and they have no nucleus. And the reason why they're built that way is because their job is to carry oxygen from the lungs to respiring cells. Um, if they had a nucleus, it would take up some of the space for the hemoglobin, which is the protein that carries the oxygen. Um, it'll take up the space inside of the cell, and you won't be able to carry as much. Now, the reason why it's bunk biconcave is to maximize what is called its surface area. So to figure out or to understand surface area, imagine you had a ball of Play-Doh and you wanted to cover it in, in as much sugar as possible. Just go, work, go with me on this one. What shape would you make it? You would roll it out really flat, and that way you could sprinkle sugar on the top, flip it over, sprinkle sugar on the bottom, and get plenty of it. What you just did was increase its surface area. So rolling it out flat or rolling it out really long would increase how much of the uh, Play-Doh is on the surface, so the surface area. Um, another cell that maximizes its surface area are root hair cells. So root hair cells have this long extension, and that is to increase the surface area of the cell. And that's because their job is to absorb water and anything dissolved in the water, specifically mineral ions from the soil. Please note root hair cells, plants we're talking about, have no chloroplasts. They are white. Then that's because underneath the ground, there will not be a lot of photosynthesis taking place. There's no sunlight. Um, structure and function of a sperm cell. Find and fertilize the egg is its function. So it has a tail that can move and a head that allows it to move through the water um, gracefully. Imagine if the sperm's head was big and square. It wouldn't get very far. And then we need to get to muscle cells. 
and ciliated cells. So ciliated cells have these little hairs on top of them that wave. Um, you will find them in the throat or the trachea, and you'll also find them in the oviduct or the fallopian tubes. Okay, so they have tiny hairs called cilia which can move mucus or move fluids and their job is to move mucus and bacteria away from the lungs. And if you find them in the oviduct, it's to make the uh, egg cell move. Muscle cells, they look like sickle cells. <laughs> they um, cause movement. What they do is they contract. Their only job is to shrink and then relax. Um, so when they merge together, they form fibers, and then they have the ability to contract on a whole. Okay? And then we went through red blood cells, transport oxygen, root hair cells to absorb. Whoa, this is the exact same diagram. And then the last one is uh, xylem cells. Xylem cells are a part of the xylem vessels that transport water. Please note the thick wall of the xylem cell is made out of lignin, and xylem cells are actually dead. Okay? Not sure what this part is about. So, so straight out of the syllabus, we have our definitions for tissue, organ, and organ system. And the syllabus tells you what whoa, the syllabus tells you what each one of the specialized cells are for. You kind of just have to explain how. Um, but they're there. Red blood cells transport oxygen, muscle cells contract, etc. Um, we get into sizes of specimens, so that's the formula for magnification. So let's say you measured your a picture of the boy. So I measured this picture, and this is me, all right? And I measure it at 12.5 centimeters. And then I look, I go to the wall, and I measure myself in real life, and I'm 220 centimeters. I can work out the magnification by using the formula image over actual, the real thing. So for me, my image was 12.5 centimeters. The real me is 220 centimeters. My magnification is 0.057. Um, if you ever needed to check to see if your magnification, ah, magnification was right, anything larger than the number one means you made the picture bigger. Anything smaller than the number one means you made the picture smaller. Not the picture. You, the picture is smaller than the real thing, or the picture is bigger than the real thing. So in this case, clearly, my picture, which is 12.5 centimeters, is smaller than the real thing. Let's do one that's bigger. So I measure this uh, tick or bed bug or whatever it is, and it is 11.5 centimeters on the picture. And then I go to the real thing, and I put it on a ruler, and it's 0.75 centimeters. Use my formula. I get 15.3. That is much bigger than the real thing, so that makes sense. Okay, so movements in and out of cells. Um, molecules moving in and out of cells is a very important topic, and there are two ways it happens, using energy and not using energy. So we'll start with osmosis. Please note this is the definition that they give you, so this is the definition that you use. Osmosis is the diffusion of water molecules from where there are a lot of water molecules, so a higher concentration to where there is a lower concentration, there is less water molecules through a partially permeable membrane. So this is my partially permeable membrane, also known as a filter, okay? And my filter will allow water molecules to move backwards and forwards, but it will not allow my red ones to move backwards and forwards. Um, now, osmosis, wherever there is the most water, it will move to where there is the least water. The water is blue. So there's four on this side, and there is two, four, six, eight on this side. So the most is on this side, so some will move this way. So what should happen is some of my water molecules will move over. That is osmosis, the water molecules moving. Um, permeable, you've heard that word in French and Spanish, it means raincoat. So semi-permeable means some things go through. Fully permeable means all things go through. Impermeable means nothing. All right, now diffusion is, ver actually we should have did diffusion first. Diffusion is when the net movement of molecules go from where there's a lot to where there's a little down a concentration gradient due to random motion. So let's look at this page again. There are a lot of molecules on this side of the slide, and there are none on this side. Now, due to the kinetic theory, molecules are always moving and bumbling and, you know, vibrating, etc. So as these molecules randomly move, if I was to s suddenly take a picture and bang, I freeze the slide. Oops. If I was to suddenly take a picture, 
you would see that my molecules moved from where there was a lot to where there was a little. All right? And now they'll continue to randomly move, and at the end of the day, they'll be spaced out evenly. That's how diffusion works. Now, the reason why the definition says the net movement is because while some of the molecules move over, some might randomly move back. It's just the way it goes. But overall, they would have moved from where there's a lot to where there's a little. Now, as a result, a lot and a little, you would see that there is a concentration gradient. Okay? Now, this seesaw is actually backwards, but you get my point. Um, the molecules move down the gradient, so the ball rolls. And after the ball rolls, you end up equal. Okay? It's so equal concentration. If one moves left or one moves right, it doesn't matter. Lastly is active transport. Active transport is respiration backwards. Okay? So it's the molecules moving in or out of a cell through a membrane against the concentration gradient. So normally the ball should roll down the hill, but if I'm doing active transport, I'll push the ball up the hill. And that requires energy release from respiration. Um, where is active transport important? Well, first and foremost, the big one is in roots. Um, if the soil is kind of dry, the root can actively pull water into the, uh, from the soil into the root. That little tiny little bit of water that's in the soil, it can actively pull it over. Um, the intestines are the same way. If you eat food that doesn't have a lot of sugar in it or has more sugar than your blood, your intestines can actively pull the sugar out of the food you digested. Please make sure you use the term molecules right and make sure you say that they move down a concentration gradient. Um, when you're talking about osmosis, you can be either talking about the volume of the solvent or the volume of the solute. Um, so let's go back. Osmosis, when they give a, oops, when they give a percentage solution, they can either be, they're talking about how much uh, of the solute is in there. And please remember, osmosis is diffusion of water molecules, okay? So if it is a strong concentration or a high concentration, that means less water. Think Kool-Aid or Ribena. So concentrated Kool-Aid or concentrated Ribena does not have a lot of water, okay? Just a quick note. Um, I've been instructed that we call this a partially permeable membrane, not a semi-permeable membrane. Oh, so it's, it's there in the uh, definition. Apparently, there's a difference between partially and, per and um, semi. So we call it a partially permeable membrane, not a semi-permeable membrane. So on to enzymes. So um, the enzyme has a specific definition straight from the curriculum. So go ahead and just memorize that for your little one marks. So an enzyme is a protein that acts, that functions as a biological catalyst. Now a catalyst is a, uh, a substance that speeds up a chemical reaction. Good way to remember it, a catalyst is an instigator, okay? So a catalyst makes things happen unnecessarily or necessarily. Now proteins, proteins, enzymes have the ability to do three things. They either break large molecules into smaller ones, so they break things down, they build things up, or they change things, okay? So the way they work, well, before we go to that, please remember enzymes are proteins, or they're made of proteins, so they are specific. They can only do one thing. They can be used over and over again and they are influenced by temperature and pH. So they can be destroyed by temperature and pH, just like any other protein. Now how enzymes work, they work through what we call the lock and key model, which is every enzyme has a active site, which is the face that all the work gets done. And if my molecule or my substrate lands on the active site properly, the enzyme catalyzes a reaction, and causes a change, all right? So if I increased my temperature just a bit, the, en the molecule should move faster, and as a result, the change should happen faster. If I decrease the temperature, 
the molecules move slower, so I would decrease the uh, reaction and the speed of it. Okay, But if I increase my temperature too high, I'll destroy my active site. And as a result, it doesn't matter how many times or ways my molecules or my products, not products, my substrate lands on the active site, nothing's going to happen. That enzyme has become what's called denatured. Okay. Please make sure when writing about an enzyme that you say that it catalyzes a reaction. Um, and remember to never say that they were killed. The correct term is denatured. So if you were to plot a graph of enzymes and pH, it would look a little bit like this. And that's because um, at the top of the graph, that pH is the optimum pH the best uh, pH for it to work at. And at the bottom, well, on either side, as we get more acidic and more basic, it, uh, the rate of reaction decreases because the active site starts to become damaged. Um, temperature looks a bit like that one. And what happens at this point, you have, again, your optimum temperature, but at the high temperatures, the enzymes become denatured again, and you have a sudden plummet. Uh, at zero, the enzymes aren't denatured. The substance is just frozen, so there's no real movement. OK? Um, oh, wow, I forgot to add this stuff. Describe the role of enzymes in germinating of seeds and making yogurt. One sec, I could do that. OK, so for seeds, um, when a seed has enough water and the right temperature, what happens is the amylase inside of the seed starts to break down the cotyledon, the starch in there, into uh, a smaller sugar. And that smaller sugar is then broken down or is used for respiration to release energy. And that's how the seed germinates. Um, then you get into, I don't know if you need the steps about gibberellin and gibberellic acid, but you, the fact that the seed needs warmth lets you know that it has something to do with enzymes, and the, uh, the water activates this process to start the uh, germination. Next, you have enzymes in washing detergents and things of that nature, which makes perfect sense, because instead of using uh, soaps and things of that nature, you just use enzymes, and the enzymes work on different things. Proteases will break down proteins, so think blood or gravy, or I don't know about gravy, but eggs. All right. So if you spilled another one, armpit stains, those are, made, those are caused by proteins. So if you have protease in your washing powder, it'll break down the armpit stain. Amylases come from starches, lipases from fats and grease. So not th these enzymes will break these things down. So if you spilled grease all over your shirt and it's stained, mix it with a little bit of lipase and some warm water, look how she spelled breaking. And, uh, it'll remove the uh, fat stain, because it'll break the fat down into fatty acids and glycerol. And then cellulase, that will actually break down the, copper, the, co uh, the cotton. So I wouldn't put cellulase in your laundry, to be honest. It'll just make your cotton under vest turn into nothing. OK, the book is arguing that if the stain is really set, that's what you use the cellulase for, to break down the uh, fibers of the clothing so that the stain can come out. I'll accept that. We can make enzymes on a large scale uh, from microorganis uh, microorganisms, so little germs that make enzymes. What we'll do is we'll breed them so, and we'll feed them and let them make lots and lots of enzymes that floats to the surface and uh, then we take it and use it for things, so for washing powders or anything else. And the way we do this is with a fermenter and all because their germs are living and they're microorganisms, they need oxygen. And what we actually do is just bubble oxygen through, keep it stirred up nice, add some food, it says feedstock, basically sugar. And of course, these microorganisms are going to respire and give off CO2, so that goes off the top. And then we just uh, feed that to the microorganisms, and bang, they keep making the enzymes that we want to use. Um, 
we do have to keep this kind of cool because many microorganisms respiring at the same time will cause the temperature to go sky high. And of course, really high temperature means the enzymes that we're trying to get from them will just end up getting denatured anyway. Um, another thing that we can use enzymes for is to get fruit juice out. Not in this slide. Found it. Okay, so a big one is uh, pectinase. And what pectinase does is it actually breaks down the fruit that you're trying to juice, so it's easier to squeeze all the juice out, all right? So think about it just pre-smashes the orange for you. Other enzymes that we use are for baking and for brewing, making cheese, and making baby food. So trypsin is a protease. They add that to baby food, so it helps break down the meat first before the poor baby has to try and eat any of that. So on to nutrition. Start with the definition and then talk about nutrients. So nutrition is defined as, not on my slides, taking in of nutrients, which are organic substances, through the mouth, okay? Oh, that's nutrition, not in, oh, my bad. No, read that, don't listen to me, read that. And for growth, repair, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the nutrients. Your three basic nutrients are, it's actually seven, but we'll call them two. We would mean three. Carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. Um, the syllabus wants you to know the elements that make them up. Elements come from your periodic table. So the elements for carbohydrates are carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Elements for fat, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen as well. Elements for protein, same three. Please note, proteins add nitrogen. So for those of you that take chemistry already, and that nitrogen that we add creates what's called an amide link. And that's why proteins are made from amino acids. Okay? So let's start with carbohydrates. So plants, we'll start with plants because they have two. Plants make carbohydrates. So first they make glucose or uh, another simple sugar. And they take that and they pack a bunch of those glucoses together. So they make this single glucose through photosynthesis. Once they have a lot, They'll pack it together, and they'll tie it all up and pack it away, and they'll call it starch. So many glucoses together from a plant will make, hello, will make starch. Keep that bike right there. All right, so many glucoses together from a plant make starch. We know this, you know, potatoes and what are other starchy vegetables? Squash. Is squash a starchy vegetable? Yeah. All right, um, another complex carbohydrate that they make is cellulose. Cellulose is the main component of the cell wall. Please make a note of that. That pops up all the time. Okay. Now, we cannot break down cellulose. Most animals can't break down cellulose. Um, the way that cows get away with it, they have multiple stomachs and they eat and vomit then chew and then rechew and there's bacteria in the stomachs that do most of the work. Um, rabbits are even more gross. They eat then poo then eat. Uh, yeah, it's nasty. So humans do not digest cellulose. We use it as uh, fiber. There should be something behind that. Wow. So we use it as fiber, and fiber helps push the sludge inside of our intestines, and it also provides some bulk for us to squeeze against, um, and that makes us happy. So remember, humans do not break down cellulose. Most organisms don't, actually. You need bacteria to help you out. Now, what do humans make if we have too much sugar? So if we eat sugar, and that's glucose right there, and we eat too much, we can pack it together as well. And when we pack it together, we pack it together as a substance called glycogen. Okay? So these substances can either be called monomers or polymers. A monomer means one, so our monomer that we're dealing with is glucose, and a polymer means many. So there are three polymers that we deal with, and they are starch, glycogen, and cellulose. Cellulose and starch are made by plants. Glycogen is made by humans. Okay? So I think I just said that. The difference being, I don't know why these are together, these two are e easily used. Um, cellulose isn't really used for energy. It's used to build things. Okay? No one digests that. So now if I take my starch, remember we build it up, well, not us, the plant built it out of glucose. I can turn that back into glucose through an enzyme called amylase. 
So what the amylase does is it attacks the bonds in between the glucose molecules, it dissolves them, or the amylase catalyzes the reaction. I need to start saying that. And now we just have a bunch of glucose molecules. If there are two of them connected together, we can call that a maltose, okay? There's a big fight about what we should call them. Um, same thing for proteins. If I take a protein and I attack it with these enzymes to catalyze the reaction, um, the group of enzymes is called protease, and there are two proteases that we deal with, pepsin and trypsin, but I digress. Those bonds will be broken, and we end up with a bunch of amino acids. And then for fats, real word is lipids, hence the term liposuction. If we use lipase to catalyze the reaction, we end up with one glycerol and three fatty acid tails. Okay, moving on to food test. Let me just double check the syllabus. Yep, right on schedule, okay. So the first food test is the test for starch. And the test for starch is to use, uh, I have to say this term right, iodine solution. So the test for starch is iodine solution. Do not say just iodine. And it should turn from brown to blue-black, just so from a light brown slash yellow color. So if I put some, some iodine solution on a potato chip, it should turn blue-black because the potato chip has starch, okay? Um, bromine water is also an option, but that goes to another topic. Um, protein test, the protein test is called the Bayeret test, and it goes from blue to purple, okay? So if I have a test tube with some blended up protein in it, and I threw some Bayeret in there, it should slowly start to turn purple. And then the sugars test for reducing sugars is the Benedict's test, and it will go through a range of colors from blue to orangey red based on how much sugar is in there. If there is zero sugar, it is blue. If there is a little bit of sugar, it is green. If there is a lot of sugar, it is orange. Please note for the Benedict's test, and you use Benedict's solution, just like before, by your ray solution, Benedict's solution. Um, the Benedict solution needs to be warmed. Uh, you want to warm it in a bath, as opposed to just sticking it on over a Bunsen burner, okay? And then you have your fats test, which is the ethanol test. And if fat is present, when you shake it up, it should turn cloudy. Okie dokie. So now we talk about our seven nutrients. So there's a list of our seven nutrients, and you need to know what each nutrient is for. So carbohydrates are used as a ready source of energy that's easily respired. We get them from pastas, rices, and breads. Okay, proteins are used for growth and repair of tissues and cells. We get them from meats and legumes. And fats are used as a long-term energy source and for uh, protection of our organs. And you get them from butters and oils. Please note, candies do not make you fat. Candies are high in sugar, so they count as carbohydrates. The reason why they, people think they make you fat is because, well, you start having too many calories, you start to put on weight, all right? So on top of that, we have vitamins, which is on that list, and the two vitamins we deal with are Vit C and Vit D, and Vit C is necessary for tissue repair and resistance to disease, okay? If you have a, uh, a deficiency of vitamin C, you develop what's called scurvy, which is uh, bleeding gums. It's something pirates used to get. And the way they dealt with it was they started taking lemons on the boat. Um, and then vitamin D, uh, we should probably say sources of vitamin C, um, citrus fruits and green leafy vegetables, okay? Next, we have vitamin D, function to strengthen bones and teeth. If you do not have enough vitamin D, so it's a deficiency, you will develop what's called uh, rickets. And that's when your bones start to bend outwards because they're too soft. Right, and you can get vitamin D from milk, um, butters, and sun exposure. Um, the next one is calcium, and calcium strengthens your bones and teeth. 
um, if you do not have enough calcium, you will develop what is called uh, osteoporosis. I refuse to accept that cal lack of calcium causes rickets as well. I think there's a big difference. Osteoporosis will cause, uh, you know, curvature of uh, the, the bones are less dense, so they actually start to crush a bit and also break easily. So that's osteoporosis. And then the last one is iron. A lack of iron causes what is called anemia. And that's because iron is used for hemoglobin, the red part of the red blood cell. So if you lack iron, you now cannot make uh, hemoglobin, which is a problem. So anemia is tiredness, often experienced by females during their menses. So there's a nice little table for you. And like I said before, most of the stuff that um, we're going through should be put into tables or made into flashcards. All right, next. Fiber is to provide bulk to our food and to absorb poisons. Remember, again, fiber comes from cellulose, and the, we cannot digest it, and it helps give our intestines something to push against when we're trying to have a number two Z. Um, a lack of fiber results in constipation, and I feel like I'm skipping some slides here, okay? And the last one is water. Um, everyone knows about water. You can live for a couple of days without food, but actually probably a couple of weeks without food, but you won't get very far without water. Okay? So we've covered all of these. Um, describe the use of, okay, so now we're on to yogurt. So how do we make yogurt? So it's actually a few very simple steps. Step one, you get some milk. And what you do is you want to boil the milk, okay? And what that does is it kills all of the germs, A-L-L, -L, right? And then what you do is you throw in yogurt germs. And after you've thrown in the yogurt germs, you seal it back up so that there's no oxygen in there, and you leave it. And these yogurt germs will turn the sugar from the yogurt, they will break it down, and they'll make an acid with it. And that's what gives yogurt its nasty flavor and it will thicken. So in reality, yogurt should not go bad even if you don't refrigerate it. It'll just get thicker and thicker and thicker. Um, if you want it to stop getting thick, you just heat it up a lot. It'll kill all the yogurt germs and it should stay the exact same way it is. Kind of weird, I know. Um, we also use <coughs> little microorganisms in other forms of industry, uh, making breads. Uh, mycoprotein is a new one, so that's for I guess vegans because it's a fungus so you vegans can eat mycoprotein as opposed to meat kind of gross moving on additives and coloring so additives and coloring are added to food hence the term additives uh, to change the favor favor the flavor the color to make it last longer or to emulsify and stabilize so emulsify and stabilize means let's say I had jello and it was kind of jiggly and standing up. Leaving it there for a week, it might all fold on, so we put something in there to keep it standing up, all right? So the advantages of that is that it makes food taste better and last longer and look better. Downside is um, not all of these additives and coloring are natural. Some are artificial, and they cause some problems like health problems, specifically uh, asthma-related, and for those who are elderly or sick. Um, and now we get into photosynthesis. So photosynthesis straight from middle school, the process by which plants manufacture carbohydrates from raw materials using light from energy. <laughs> using energy from light, I can't read. Okay, so there is a word equation for photosynthesis, and it's right there. Carbon dioxide plus water goes to glucose plus oxygen. And then there's the symbol equation down below. Please make sure you're able to balance the equation um, with the sixes. So as we uh, remember from middle school, it is chloroplasts who are responsible for, well, chlorophyll inside the chloroplast for photosynthesis. So the house is called the chloroplast and the workers inside the house are called chlorophyll, and they convert um, water and carbon dioxide into 
a sugar and oxygen using light from energy. Energy from light, I did that again. Okay, so there's your definition for chlorophyll. Now please note, all three of these guys are needed for photosynthesis to take place. Okay, all that their powers need to combine. If anyone is missing, photosynthesis does not happen. So that's one control. Part two, whoever is the smallest or the least amount, that person will determine how much photosynthesis takes place. So let's say in this situation, there's only a little bit of carbon dioxide. Then even though there's a lot of light and a lot of chlorophyll, there will not be a lot of photosynthesis. Um, imagine you're making a sandwich, but you only have a little bit of mayonnaise. You could have 10,000 pieces of bread. Without enough mayonnaise, there ain't no sandwiches. And vice versa. You can have 60 gallons of mayonnaise, but if you only have one slice of bread, no sandwiches. Um, a quick experiment to see the rate of photosynthesis in a plant. You take a water-based plant, so pondweed, and you mix carbon dioxide into some uh, water. So a hydrogen carbonate solution does the same thing. It gets the carbon into the water, and then you show it some light. What you'll start to see is bubbles, and I skipped a slide, forming because that plant is photosynthesizing. Now, if I put the light closer, why am I going so fast? If I put the light closer, what you'll notice is that a lot more bubbles are forming. So the light intensity has something to do with the rate of photosynthesis. Please note, I could also mix more hydrogen carbonate there too. That'll do it too. So what you find is that photosynthesis happens fastest around lunchtime, when the light is the most intense. Okay, so leaves are effectively sun catchers or sun sails. Um, a quick point to note, leaves are filled with starch. It's the reason why animals can eat them. And you can test this using um, the same starch test that you use for food, which is um, iodine solution. Gotta start saying solution level, all right? But it's a bit of a different um, process. First, you have to get all the color out of the leaves, and we call it de-starching. Oh no, that's before, sorry. Get all the color out is this one. There you go. So in order to remove all the color, you have to boil the leaf in hot water. And then what that does is it opens up the pores, and then you boil the leaf in alcohol. And then you rinse it off with some uh, more water, and you spread it out, and it should be nice and white. All right, like that color. And then you could put your iodine solution on there. So just make sure you know the steps to this bad boy. Um, in maybe just a table form, so to speak. Uh, they say that you should de-starch the plant by leaving it in the dark for 48 hours. And that's to try and minimize <coughs> the amount of starch that's already there. So it's, you can figure out where it's made. That's pretty much all that's about. I'm just talking now. Um, no. So photosynthesis requires CO2 and makes oxygen. How does the CO2 get into the leaf? And it gets into the leaf through holes in the bottom called stomata, individual called stoma. And the stomata open and close based on how much water is in them. So they use active respiration or active transport, sorry. They use active transport um, to use energy from respiration to open and close from water. So if there's a lot of water in the guard cells, they pop open and the CO2 is able to diffuse in. If the water is removed from the guard cells, they shrink close, and that's it. Nothing can get in or out. Please note, while they are open, CO2 can get in, oxygen can get out, but water vapor can also get out. Both the oxygen, the water vapor, and the CO2 diffuse in and out. This is your vascular bundle right here, with xylem on the top and phloem on the bottom. Remember, xylem, transport, water. All right, so how do we maintain this diffusion gradient? How do I force CO2 diffuse to diffuse in and force oxygen to diffuse out? Well, imagine this analogy. Let's say every time you had no money, your parents gave you more. What would you do to make sure your parents are always giving you money? And the answer is you want to spend it. You want to burn it. You want to leave it on the street. That's how diffusion works as well. Diffusion loves it when a lot goes to a little. So 
what I have to do is make sure that there's almost no CO2 inside and lots of CO2 outside. And what that does is it forces diffusion to happen and vice versa. For the oxygen side, I make sure there's a lot of oxygen inside so that it diffuses outward. Um, so here we have a cross-reference of a leaf. And you need to be able to label all the layers and slightly describe the function of each of the layers. Slightly describe, is that a? Yeah, I found one. OK, so they have the same diagram that I have. Whoops. OK, so that's all the same. You just have to say what each part of it does. And there you go. Make a table, get her done. OK, so moving on. Now, let's talk about the function of each layer. So your photosynthesis layer, or the main photosynthesis layer, is the palisade mesophyll. OK, um, then you have a vascular bundle, which is for support and supply of xylem for water and minerals, phloem to remove stuff. Um, gas exchange happens in the air spaces and along the sponging mesophyll and the wet surfaces there. Okay. Um, fertilizers. So fertilizers provide missing nutrients to the soil for the plant to utilize. Um, chemical fertilizer, you have two types, chemical and natural. Chemicals um, deliver exact amounts of nutrients to a plant instantly, so it's instantly water soluble. Um, and they come with ratios of uh, NPK, so nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Potassium. <laughs> okay. Um, natural fertilizers are not specific, and they last a lot longer because they have to be broken down first. So think cow manure. All right. So nitrate ions, or the nitrogen in the fertilizer, is used for protein production, and a lack of protein production normally means uh, poor growth. And then the magnesium ions are used for chlorophyll production. And a lack of magnesium production normally means yellow leaves. OK? Um, too much fertilizers cause something called eutrophication. And eutrophication is when the fertilizer leaks into um, water systems. And the water plants, especially the microscopic ones, gobble up all of this fertilizer. So think algae. And the algae gobble up this fertilizer, and they suddenly grow and they blossom and bloom, and there's a kajillion algae in the lake now. They suddenly die off because there isn't enough food for them to really survive it well. Uh, why do they die? I don't know. Not enough space? They start to block the light? Yeah, they start to block the light. So they die, and they start to decay. Um, also, when they grow over the large surface, they block the light to the uh, seaweed and things of that nature, and the seaweed dies as well. Now, all of this dead stuff in the lake has to get broken down by microorganisms, and those microorganisms use oxygen. So suddenly, the sunlight is being blocked. The sedge grass cannot make oxygen anymore. So all the oxygen in the lake starts to uh, decrease, which eventually kills the fish. And there you go. So the algae bloom results in blocked sunlight. Then it results in a bacterial bloom which results in decreased oxygen and death. Yay! And that's eutrophication. And that's animal nutrition. By animal, we mean us. OK? Uh, animal nutrition, we start with balanced diet. Balanced diet is when you have the adequate intake of nutrients necessary to sustain the body and ensure good health and growth. So this will be different for different people at different times of their lives. You'll need more you know, proteins when you're growing. Um, you'll need more calcium and carbohydrates when you're pregnant. Uh, if you're menstruating, if you exercise a lot, these all need different amounts of nutrients and different types of nutrients. So malnutrition is a condition caused by an unbalanced diet. And the two that we deal with, well, we deal with more than two, but these are the two that we're dealing with right now. Um, so you're thinking starvation. You have two forms of starvation. You have uh, marasmus and kawashikor. Now, marasmus is when there is not enough 
carbohydrates or proteins. So everything starts to waste away, low body mass, thin arms, little muscle, and an old looking face. And then you have Kawashikor, and that's where you have swelling of the abdomen um, and fat accumulation in the liver. This is caused by a lack of proteins, okay? The liver has to make protein, so it's being overworked, and that's why it swells. Um, but there isn't, this person has enough carbohydrates. They just do not have enough proteins. The next one is obesity, and that is high intake of fatty foods and high carbohydrate foods and too little exercise. Um, another problem or obesity has a tendency to lead to uh, coronary heart disease, which is blockage of the coronary artery due to fatty plaque buildups. Um, not enough water or fiber normally re results in constipation, and that's when feces move too slowly through the digestive tract, and as a result, too much water is absorbed, and they get stuck. Lovely. I had a joke there, but I leave it, I'll leave it alone. Okay, so obesity, constipation, marasmus, and kawashikor. Um, there should not be a starvation issue on this planet. We are making more food than we ever had before. We have machines which help with the agriculture. We have fertilizers which increase crop yield, pesticides that kill off the, uh, the invasive pests, that, and herbicides that kill off the invasive plants. And then we have artificial and genetic engineering. So artificial selection is if I have 100 banana trees, I only let the trees that make lots of bananas uh, breed. Or I only plant, let them make seeds, and they plant their seeds. I don't plant anyone else's seeds. Bananas was a horrible example. Apple trees. So the, the apple trees that have big apples, I plant those apples to make more apples. And over time, I'll only have big apple trees left. And then genetic engineering, that's the creepy part. That's where we start adding genes from other species and even other animals into our crops to make them uh, more resistant to disease or bigger or grow faster, et cetera. Um, the reason why there's food shortages due to starvation, uh, politics, economics, war, poverty, and sometimes famine, okay? So famine results from uh, drought or flooding. And, you know, if you drought or flood, you can't grow the food. So let's start with the actual digestion and the eating process. Okay, so digestion begins with food going into the mouth. Um, we have to say mouth because there are other ways to get food substances in. And egestion is the final passing food out that has not been digested. I feel like I spelled feces wrong. I don't know. I don't care. All right. So this is your basic alimentary canal or digestive system. You need to be able to label everything on this side. Don't worry about the ones that are already there. If they match, good for you. But you need to be, labeled, to be able to label all of them. Um, regions of digestion. Ingestion, so that starts with chewing and swallowing. So of course you chew, um, that smashes the food up and mix it with saliva from the salivary glands. And then you swallow this ball of food that is called a bolus, and it is pushed down the esophagus through a process called peristalsis. So peristalsis, P-E-R, istalsis. And what that is, it's, it's rings of muscle that squeeze behind the bolus or the ball of food, forcing it down. It's, it's kind of like squeezing toothpaste out of a tube. All right, then you get digestion, turning big molecules into small molecules, and this happens in a bunch of different places. Then you get absorption, moving the food molecules from the digestive system to the blood, and then egestion, um, the great escape. Okay, uh, one of the steps that was skipped on that one is assimilation, and that's where your body tells the food molecules where to go and what to do. So digestion, please note this definition lets you know really quickly that first of all, food molecules are insoluble and they need to become soluble. It also lets you know that there's a mechanical and a chemical process. So the mechanical process turns big pieces into small pieces. 
it is still the, the original product. So a mechanical for sandwich will be breaking the sandwich up into smaller sandwiches. I can still share it. All right? And the reason why it does this is to, decrease, uh, to increase the surface area. Three ways that we do mechanical digestion, chew in with the teeth, contractions in the stomach, and emulsification by the bile. Now, why do we want to increase the surface area? Imagine the food was the blue ninja, OK? We want the enzymes, which are these little guys, to attack or to catalyze a reaction on the food. So we want to let them have as much space to hit as possible. If he was rolled up in a ball, many enzymes would not be able to uh, catalyze a reaction because they wouldn't have any space. So we want to open him up. And that's what chewing does. Um, basic structure of the tooth, you need to know that. And you need to know the four different types of teeth and how many of them you have. Okay? Hit pause, make a table. Um, your four types of teeth and their shapes and uh, structure and function. Okay? And then uh, the concept of plaque, which is saliva plus bacteria. If you feed the bacteria sugar, they will create acid. And the acid is what wears away the enamel on your teeth and causes cavities. Ways to prevent cavities are to just take care of your teeth. Um, regular blush brushing. Brushing and flossing, eat less sugars, drink more water, visit the dentist. Um, there is a conspiracy about the fluoride. Um, fluoride strengthens the enamel of the teeth so that the acid doesn't wear it through as quickly. But there are also arguments that fluoride kills the body and has long-term effects that we don't know about. And there are some people who are being over-fluorinated. Um, have fun trying to have a question on that and answer it. And we keep moving along, and we talk about bile and its emulsification properties. So if you were to try and chew oil, it will just turn into a bunch of m little oil droplets, then turn back into a big drop of oil. So we need something to keep the oil separated into little balls. And that's what bile does. Bile separates and breaks the fat into little pieces of fat and surf, um, circles it so that it can't stick back together. And then, and we call that emulsification. That increases the surface area for the enzymes to work on, like we said before. Um, little pointed note, bile is made by the liver, stored in the gallbladder. So you'll get to that in a second. Um, so after we bite, chew, chew, swallow, well, we're still on chew, let's talk about uh, what happens in the mouth. So as you're chewing, your mouth releases, or your salivary glands release saliva, which are mixed with salivary, which has salivary amylase mixed in it. And the salivary amylase breaks down starch. You can also find an amylase in the duodenum that is made by the pancreas. Okay, so you're gonna have to make a table out of this, so just get watch it twice and make a table. All right, so starch is digested in the mouth and the duodenum by salivary and pancreatic amylase. These are made by the salivary glands in the pancreas. Um, proteins are digested in the stomach and the duodenum as well and they are digested by pepsin, which is in the stomach, and trypsin, which is in the duodenum. And they are made by st the stomach and stomach acid and the pancreas. And then the last one, fats or lipids, are digested in the duodenum. And of course, bile helps out. Um, bile is made in the liver, whoops, stored in the gallbladder, and is released into the bile duct. Uh, lipase is reduced, released from the pancreas. Okay, so you should have a little table there, and you should be able to figure that table out. Um, back to the, well, we don't have to worry about the peristalsis. So now we move into the small intestine, the second half of it, which is called the uh, ileum. Okay, now the ileum, because it absorbs, it needs to have a very, very high surface area. So what it does is it has these little fingers called villi, individual villus. And each of those fingers has fingers. It's, it's creepy. So it looks like a big carpet, all right? And that's your, your ileum. So it looks like your carpet. Now inside of each of these villus, villi, yeah, villus, is a blood supply that is going to move the products of digestion from the small intestine into the bloodstream, OK? So once we get to this point, all that's really left 
is glucose, amino acids, fatty acids, and glycerol, the byproducts of digestion. So just watch this little animation. The glucose diffuses across into the blood vessel, moves on to the liver. The amino acids move across, diffuse across into the blood vessel to the liver. The fatty acids and glycerol diffuse into what's called the lacteal, and that's attached to the lymphatic system. Okay, rewind and watch again. So uh, on the way to the liver, it goes through this HPV, the hepatic portal vein. So we're starting with glucose. The glucose comes through the hepatic portal vein into the liver, and the liver has a couple of options. First option, pass it on to the body, don't do anything with it, the body needs it. The second option, if the liver has lots of sugar coming in and the body already has sugar, the liver can turn those glucose molecules into something bigger and store it. And they'll, well not bigger, but into a storage compound called glycogen, okay? Now if there is no glucose in the blood, the liver can turn that glycogen back into glucose and pass it on. A um, little bit different for amino acids. Amino acids are either used, not amino, yes, are either used right away, but they cannot be stored, so they are immediately broken down if we don't need them. So they are turned into ammonia, which is NH3, and we turn that ammonia into urea, and we pass it on to the body, which it then gets filtered by the kidneys. Um, what's left over, we pass on to be burned and used in respiration, okay? So ammonia is a poison, okay? Quick note, that's why we have to turn it into something less poisonous like urea and send it off to the kidneys to get uh, filtered out. So that process is called deamination, the removal of the nitrogen. So remember, amino acids have nitrogen and we remove that nitrogen turn it into ammonia, and turn the ammonia into urea, and that is deamination. Okay, um, please note, your poor, poor liver has to deal with everything first. So toxins, alcohols, poisons, medications, it's the liver that has to deal with them, so be nice to your liver. All right, ooh, I haven't adjusted this in a while. Good thing we looked at it. Um, small intestine absorb, absorbs a lot of water, but the colon's only job is to absorb water. I know you had to make that distinction I've seen before. The small intestine does absorb a lot of water, but that's not its job. Its job is to absorb you know, sugars and glucose and amino acids and jazz. It just happens to absorb the water too. The colon's job is to absorb water. It just doesn't do that much. It's kind of weird, all right? So fats, um, we talked about everything else. Fats are either used, burned, or stored. Okay, eh. now we're on to transportation in plants. So plants, uh, we know that the leaves make sugar and the roots absorb water. Um, and we know that the leaves need the water and the roots need the sugar. So how do these substances switch sides? Um, for the water, they move up a bunch of tubes called xylem, and in the water would be any minerals dissolved. For everything else, sugar, amino acids, hormones, poisons, you know, those types of things, they're gonna move up and down in phloem. Please note, phloem is alive, xylem is dead, okay? So water absorbs or is moved into root hair cells um, from the soil via diffusion. You can also have active transport if necessary. Okay, so root hair cells have a very large surface area, and then the water moves via osmosis. Wait, would this one be osmosis too? I think this one would be osmosis as well, or active transport. Then water moves via osmosis through the xylem and the cortex into your, not the xylem, through the root hair cells and the cortex into the xylem. Okay, so soil, root hair cell, cortex, xylem. Once it goes up the xylem, it ends up in the leaf, and the leaf has the mesophyll, the airspace, through the stomata to outside, okay? Um, cross sections, so this is the cross section of a root, this is the cross section of a shoot. 
Cross section means I sliced it and looked down. Um, cross section of a root, your xylem is in red, your phloem is in blue. I don't know why my phloem is in um, animated. So the xylem is the X in the middle. Please note xylem is always very close to the center of my roots and my shoots. It's not in the very, very center of the shoot because that's all the woody part. And then the phloem is on the outside. Um, if you did an experiment where you used a colored liquid and let it get a, um, sucked into the plant through transpiration or root pressure, you can actually identify the inside of the vascular bundles to show the xylem. Okay, so food coloring should do that. Now, when the water leaves the leaves, <laughs> if water escapes from a leaf through the stomata, we call that transpiration. Okay, so transpiration happens when the stomata are open and gases like water vapor are allowed to escape. So here's a little demonstration. The water vapor on the outside of the <laughs> spongy mesophyll goes from liquid water, just on the surface, and it, it evaporates and turns into a gas. Now that it's a gas, there is more gas water outside than inside, so more water vapor outside than inside than outside, sorry, so it diffuses out, okay? So from liquid to gas, and once it's a gas, it has to follow the laws of diffusion, and that water vapor diffuses out of the stomata. That is transpiration, okay? Now we understand the rate of transpiration, we just don't realize we understand it yet. Imagine your leaf was a cup and the spongy mesophyll was a sponge with water in it. If I had a hot day and a cold day and one hole in both cups, which sponge dries out the fastest? Yes, you guessed it, the hot one. Okay, why? And that's because higher temperature means water molecules moving faster, so they'll diffuse out. Um, if I added more holes and had the temperatures the same, which sponge would dry out the fastest? You got it right again, the one with the more holes. All right? If I had a big cup versus a small cup in the same temperature, which sponge would dry out? This one, because there's more air, so more water molecules can get up there. And this one, after about 50 molecules leave, it's filled up the cup in terms of the gaseous space. This one is just more space. All right? If I had a bigger sponge versus a smaller sponge, then you can really see it. So the sponge drying is the same as transpiration. So anything that will make a sponge dry faster will increase transpiration, all right? Spongy mesophyll is the name. Um, now, the reason why water moves up the xylem is due to two properties of water. Cohesion, which is the water molecule's ability to stick to each other, and adhesion. Is one missing? Yeah. Is it afterwards? No. So adhesion and cohesion. Cohesion is the water molecule's ability to stick together. Adhesion is the water molecule's ability to stick to something else. So all of these water molecules, they really want to touch each other. So as these water molecules leave the surface and evaporate, it leaves a space which forces them to shimmy up. Because my xylem is so thin, the water molecules stick to the sides of the xylem as well, and they're able to creep up the xylem. Uh, the best example I can think of that is this. What you used to do when you were a kid, walk down the hallway or climb up the door frame. Water molecules do the same. They have the ability to stick to the sides of the xylem and that allows them to climb up, okay? Because that xylem is so thin, the water molecules stick to either side, but they're also stuck to each other. So when one pulls, it just drags them up. And we call this process transpiration pull. As the water molecules at the spongy mesophyll evaporate, they leave the surface and they pull all the molecules behind them. All right, so rates of transpiration can be changed due to temperature. Oh, I've done a great job on this one. Temperature, wind speed, and light intensity and humidity. So the cups again. Um, wilting is when your plant starts to die due to a lack of water. If there isn't enough water, the cell becomes flaccid, which means it gets soft and then it becomes plasmolysis. Plasmolysis occurs, plasmolysis is the word, and that's when the cell membrane or the cytoplasm is pulled away from, I feel like it's the cell membrane pulls away from the wall, but we'll go if cytoplasm is pulled away from the wall. Okay, so that's wilting. Oh, I haven't done these, let me go to these real quick. So plants in different environments have adapted in different ways, so we're gonna talk about 
a dry environment and a wet environment, okay? So the ones in the dry environment, what they've done is, instead of having big leaves, which can lose a lot of water, they turn the leaves into spines. So think cactus, all right? They have very few stomata, and they actually do not open their stomata during the day. They just deal with it. They open it at night and do very little photosynthesis during the day. They just do it that way. Um, then you have water plants. Oh, on top of that, yeah, I should say that. They have a very thick waxy cuticle, so that really reduces the water loss. And or these ones, they have sunken stomata. So their stomata are open, but they're kind of hidden. Okay? Um, water plants, they put their stomata on the top of the leaves, which makes perfect sense. Um, their roots do not grow into any substrate. They just float, and they're filled with air so that they float as well. And of course, there's uh, the stomata on the top, because other than that, they will just be sucking in water. OK? So I want to find the words. I'm looking for xerophyte. There you go. So xerophytes live in deserts and where there's very little water or where there's a lot of wind. And then you have hydrophytes. Where's the word? Not in this. Lovely. Yeah, so the three words are xerophytes. I'll write it. Uh, zero fight, hydrophyte, and uh, mesophyte means it's a plant that lives in just a regular environment, okay? So xerophyte, hydrophyte, and mesophyte. You would need to explain and talk about how they've changed in order to uh, survive in their environment. But th I just told you the basic ones, so no worries. Next is translocation, and that's where we move it says sucrose and amino acids, but basically everything but water and minerals. So we move stuff through the phloem from where it's made to where it's stored, or from where it's made to where it can be used. Okay? So translocation goes through the phloem. It uses water from the xylem, but the uh, companion cells are there to help, hence the term companion cells. So it goes from source to sink. During the day, the source, or during sunny seasons, the source is the leaf. The leaf makes the sugar, all right? And then it passes it down the tube, down the phloem, or actively goes down the phloem to the sink, which is the root cell. Um, please note, sources and sinks can switch based on time of year and time of day. If it's wintertime and all the leaves fall off the tree, then the source is no longer the leaves. The source is the root, OK? Um, they prove where phloem exists through the ringing experiment. If you were to cut away the bark of a plant and leave it over time, it'll start to get fat around the edges, and that's because the leaves are pushing sugar down and making that overfill. Um, this is how we actually use some types of poisons for weeds. You put the poison on the leaf, and then the phloem passes it down to the root. That kills the root and vice consequently kills the plant. You want a slow-acting poison. If you had a poison that killed the leaf instantly, the uh, living phloem would not be able to pump it down. So it doesn't fall. It does not gravity. That is an active process that requires respiration. Okay? And for seasonal, your direction switches. If there are no leaves, that's not the source. Um, circulatory system, on to humans. Wow, this is long. Circulatory system is a system of tubes with a pump and valves to ensure one-way flow of blood. And our bodies pump blood twice, once to the lungs at low pressure and once to the body at high pressure, OK? If you pumped blood to the lungs at high pressure, it will destroy them. Now, our heart and our blood system, our circulatory system have valves, and valves ensure that the blood only flows in one direction. So think of it like a door. If the wind blows one way, the door opens. But if the wind blows the other way, the door slams shut. That's how valves work. Now, when the heart is pumping the blood, it does not use the blood that goes through its main chambers. Um, so the equivalent would be like a teller, who's the heart. 
um, and you tell him to put your money in the bank, he just puts it in the bank. He does not take any for himself. And when he, you want some money from the bank, he just takes the money out and gives it to you. He does not keep any for itself. He gets his money from a paycheck. Okay? No paycheck, the teller stops doing the work. Same thing with the heart. The heart just transfers the body, the body, the blood from the lungs to the body and from the body to the lungs. It gets paid through the coronary arteries. All right? So if you damage, destroy, block any of these types of words, the coronary artery, you develop coronary heart disease. Now, how can you reduce coronary heart disease? You can reduce your stress, um, watch your diet, do not smoke, and there probably should have been one more, exercise regularly. Yeah. Now, this is a diagram of the heart. The diagram is always as if that picture was on the front of your chest, right? So its left is your right when you're facing it. But just put the paper on your chest to face everybody else and you'll be right. So this is the right side and this is the left side. Please note there's a difference. If you do not know the right and the left, the left side is thicker. And that's because it pumps to the body, but we'll go through that. So there's your basic labels and the heart beats twice. The first time it beats, it squeezes the top. There should be some arrows. There you go. The first time it beats, it squeezes the top, and that forces the blood down. And the second time it beats, it squeezes the bottom. And that's why you hear boom, 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 boom. OK? So again, when it squeezes the top, it forces the blood down. When it squeezes the bottom, it forces the blood back up. And these valves are like French doors. When the blood's going down, they open. But if it tried to go back up, it'll close. So they have to go through there. All right. Um, when you exercise, your muscles start to respire. No respiration increases, so your muscles need more oxygen and glucose, and they're creating more as carbon dioxide. So what you have is your regular pulse rate is like a wheelbarrow. It just pushes a bunch of blood, bump, 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 bump. If your body suddenly needs more, what the pulse does is it a beats harder, so more blood goes, so it increases the volume. And B, it beats faster, so it increases the speed. OK? Once you have more blood going faster, now you can uh, exercise even harder. So the heart beats harder and faster. When it beats harder, it increases the volume. Um, there's a section about, let's look straight at the syllabus and help you out here. So we're on, ooh, transport of humans. Pulse rate, coronary heart disease, double circulation, done, done, done. You have to name the valves, well, the main arteries. I don't know where that is. It's in here somewhere. Hold up. I should have hit pause. Oh, there you go. Name the main blood vessels to and from the heart, lungs, liver, and kidney. Anything going to the heart, so this is on its way back to the heart, is a vein. And anything coming from the heart, in theory, is an artery, OK? So arteries come from the heart, veins go to the heart. That's the rule that stands. Nine times out of 10, the, ox the blood that's in the arteries is oxygenated, but there is one situation where it's backwards, OK? So if it has to do with the liver, it's the hepatic artery and vein. The hepatic artery gives the liver blood. The hepatic portal vein comes from the small intestine. And the hepatic vein goes back to the heart. Renal artery gives the kidney blood. Renal vein back to the heart. You notice the pulmonary ones have the colors backwards. And that'll make sense in a second. The reason why we give the lungs uh, um, blood is so that it can pick up oxygen. So of course, the blood, the blood that we give it has no oxygen in it. And then the pulmonary vein is going away. Now, arteries go away from the heart, so they have to withstand high pressure. So they have a very small lumen or space. They have lots of muscle and lots of elastic inside of their walls. And they have high pressure blood. Capillaries are one cell thick to allow diffusion of CO2 and oxygen in and well through them, so it's not even into them. And then veins have very low pressure. They always go toward the heart. They have a very large lumen. And they have valves that allow the blood to pool and build up pressure. 
um, in between beats or muscular contractions. If you've ever seen a soldier standing on parade, one thing they used to tell you was to wiggle your toes, and that forces the calf muscles to contract and squeeze the blood up, because other than that, you'll pass out. So when the blood is coming from the heart in an artery, it's high pressure. When it hits the capillaries, it really starts to slow down. These capillaries are only as thick as one blood uh, cell. And the oxygen and nutrients diffuses out to the tissues. The waste product diffuses into the uh, plasma. And then it moves on through the vein. Okay? You need to be able to identify blood cells and white blood cells and red blood cells. There are two types of white, a phagocyte, which has a lobed nucleus, and a lymphocyte, which has a big nucleus. So in this one, that's your lymphocyte, that's your, nah, that's your phagocyte, that's your lymphocyte, and these are all red blood cells. Um, I like to think of blood more like a soup, with the broth being plasma, and all the little vegetables being platelets, white blood cells and red blood cells. Um, you have to state what each one of these do, so have fun looking that up. Um, most of the blood is plasma. Oh, well, there's your list of what they do, so there you go. Please note, plasma transports the carbon dioxide, not the red blood cells. Um, the difference between a lymphocyte and a phagocyte, phagocytes, well, we'll start with lymphocytes. Lymphocytes create antibodies, and antibodies, when they find a germ, they either destroy it, or they label it, or they make this germ stick together so that the phagocytes can come and eat it. Phagocytes are just hungry, hungry hippos, okay? Um, and they have a little something to do with, uh, what's this topic? Tissue rejection. Let's say someone gave you a kidney. You would need to take what is called an immunosuppressant, which is basically a drug that tells your lymphocytes and your phagocytes to take a chill pill so that your kidney has a chance to um, establish itself before because other than that, they will just attack it and kill it because they're stupid like that. Okay. Um, uh, lymph drainage. So we need to talk about lymph. So in between uh, your tissues, you will have a bunch of fluid. And the lymphatic system is where all of that fluid drains into. Okay. The lymphatic system is filled with, that's where a lot of the white blood cells and that's where your immunity comes from as well. So plasma tissue fluid and lymph, plasma tissue fluid and uh, lymph are three very similar fluids, but they occur in different places. So make sure you get the difference. Plasma is mixed with the red blood cells. Tissue fluid is in between the tissues, and lymph is in the lymph sphatic system. Okay. So the extra water and the extra fluid and anything that's escaped drains into the lymphatic system. So that's why those, your lymph nodes tend to get swollen when you're sick, because those are the glands that have the extra stuff. All right, so lymph nodes are where the lymphocytes build up, you know, the lymphocytes. So you have that extra fluid in there, and then you have all the lymphocytes going nuts, and that's why your lymph nodes tend to, uh, to swell when you're sick. Um, we should get into clotting next, I think. Yes, blood clotting. So basically what happens is when a blood vessel is broken, your platelet goes from just a little ball into a, uh, turns into like a spiky ball that sticks. And then as they start to stick, your a substance is released called fibrinogen. And that starts to also stick to the, where am I? Okay. That also starts to stick to the platelets and that fibrinogen turns into fibrin, which are these little, where is the mouse? Strings that are helping to clot the broken vessel. So your scabs or the clot is a mixture of red blood cells, platelets, and fibrin. And the fibrin is a result of the presence of fibrinogen. Okay, guys, almost there. Um, no, sorry. We are still almost there, but we're on eight, not nine. It only goes to 10. So we're on to respiration. Respiration is the chemical reactions that break down a nutrient molecule in living cells to release energy. So we break down a nutrient molecule, mostly glucose, 
to release energy. What do we need this energy for? Um, movement, uh, muscular contractions, sorry, which result in movement, all right? Um, nervous impulses being sent, um, protein synthesis for growth, all right? So an analogy I like to use, I feel like that list should be longer. It's right there. Um, active transport, cell division, protein synthesis. Oh, wow, there's a, it's a longer list than I had pictures for. And maintenance of a constant body temperature. So um, uh, this was my first analogy for respiration. It's a tool or it's a process that releases energy from a nutrient and leaves behind two waste products, carbon dioxide and water. Okay, so that would be the leftover shell. Um, but please note oxygen's missing. So I guess oxygen is the hand pushing down. And there's your little formula in words and your formula in numbers, well, symbols. Please note, this is just photosynthesis backwards. 6H2O plus 6CO2 goes to 6O2 and 6C, that one. That's just photosynthesis backwards, all right? So aerobic respiration is when you release, please, the, the words in orange are there for a reason, guy. Large amounts of energy, presence of oxygen, all right? Anaerobic respiration is small amounts of energy, no oxygen, all right? Now, I guess I'm saying all right. Oxygen debt is a funny topic. Let's say you go for a sprint, um, and your body actually needs this entire square worth of oxygen. Unfortunately, you only got the blue square worth of oxygen, which means that you owe your body was short that purple triangle. Um, after you, since you are working harder than your body is getting its oxygen, it's going to be respiring anaerobically and producing lactic acid. The, in order for the act lactic acid to be removed, you need to give your body oxygen to remove it. So after you've done your exercise, so I stop here, you owe your body some oxygen to get rid of that lactic acid. And we call that um, post-exercise or EPOC. And that's the reason why after you go for a run, you end up <gasps> breathing like a dead animal because you're giving the body the oxygen that it, you owe it, it's oxygen debt. The fitter you are, um, the less debt you accumulate, and also, the more you run, the more the more your body gets used to this debt, so it doesn't hurt as much. But that burning you feeling you feel when you run your legs, that's lactic acid, all right? So when there is no oxygen in humans, if we respire faster than the oxygen supplied, we produce lactic acid and a little bit of energy. Um, microorganisms, if they don't have oxygen, they actually produce alcohol and carbon dioxide. And we, we like to use this process to help us make bread, all right? We put, use yeast, give them some sugar, throw them in the fridge or on the counter or leave it in the oven overnight without it turned on. You notice the bread is a lot bigger and that's because all the carbon dioxide that the yeast was releasing got stuck in the dough. Please note that lump of bread also has alcohol in it. So if you ate dough, you can get drunk. When you bake it, all the alcohol goes away. All right, not just bread, we also use this to make beer and wine and I don't know, other stuff like beer and wine. What else do people drink? Apple teenies. All right, remember that aerobic respiration releases a lot of energy, anaerobic respiration, not so much. So your basic respiratory system, um, you need to be able to label and the process of inhalation and exhalation. So inhalation and exhalation have everything to do with changing the volume of the lungs. And there are two ways to change the volume, increase or decrease. And we increase and decrease the volume of the lungs via the rib cage and the diaphragm. So let's talk about breathing in. When you are breathing in, um, sorry, the Where am I to? Why am I on an exhale? Sorry. When you are breathing in, the rib cage moves up and out, okay? So the muscles in between the rib cage relax, and the muscles on the outside of the rib cage contract and lift it up, all right? So they get wider, and that rib cage gets a little bit bigger. And what you'll notice is that the diaphragm contracts and flattens. So now your ribs are getting they're lifting and the bottom of it's dropping and that causes the pressure to decrease and air comes in. All right, oops, too much. When you exhale, 
the rib cage moves down and in. So what happens is the muscles in between the rib cage, right here, they contract, they shrink, and they pull the, uh, the ribs back together. And then the diaphragm relaxes and goes back into its dome shape. All right, it's originally that shaped and contraction makes it flat. So it relaxes back into its dome shape. That increases the pressure in the lungs and causes, decreases the volume, increases the pressure, air gets f uh, forced out. So the air, as you know, gets cleaned by, is it here? I think it's a few slides away. Yes, the air gets cleaned by cilia inside of the trachea and the bronchi and the bronchioles, and they look like mini semen anemones. And, what they, and they move mucus that traps the particles in the pathogens, so they start to wave, and it moves the mucus that traps the particles in the pathogens back up and out so that you can snot it out. Um, smoking is a problem, and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, for those of you that were around during the fire at the dump, it's the reason why you were blowing black snot out for about a month after the fire finished. Now, once the oxygen, well, once the air goes down the windpipe and into the lungs, it gets to these little cauliflowers or bunches of grapes called alveoli. And the alveoli are surrounded by uh, capillaries or a blood supply. And what happens is oxygen that was brought into the lungs by breathing diffuses into the red blood cells, and the carbon dioxide diffuses out of the uh, plasma and into that space and you breathe that out, okay? So when you get to your, uh, I had another slide, I had no idea where it went. So in order for this gas exchange to take place, um, your lungs, well your alveoli need to have certain properties. And the way to, a good way to explain it is trying to push tennis balls through a uh, fence, all right? If you want to push as many tennis balls as possible through the fence, you want a really long fence and a lot of people with tennis balls. And we see that in the lungs. You have a large surface area and lots of blood cells, okay? You also make sure that there are as many balls as possible available, so everyone's just grabbing and pushing, and you want to make sure that fence is very thin. You're not trying to push it through a concrete wall, because that would take you forever. Just a thin fence. Um, it'll help if it was wet. That will push the balls right through. And that's pretty much how your lungs work. High surface area, so as much fence as possible. Good blood supply, as many balls as possible. A thin wall and it needs to be moist. Oh, there's my slide. So that's what each alveolus looks like. The air goes in and out, and what we do is maintain a steep uh, concentration gradient. Keep a lot of oxygen in this, and a very little bit of carbon dioxide in this, and it'll force the diffusion to happen the way we want it. Okay, so we've talked about pathogens and cilia and mucus and all the grossness. Um, let's talk about smoking. So the reason why we don't want to smoke is because tobacco smoke has these four, uh, I guess you could call them components. I was going to say drugs, but they're not all drugs. And each one does something different. Tar does this, hit pause and write it down. Um, nicotine does this, hit pause and write it down. Carbon monoxide is this, again. And smoke particles are this. Cool. So inspired air versus expired air. So inspired air is the air that you breathe in. When you breathe in, this is roughly the percentages of what's in it. Please note nitrogen, watch. When you breathe out, nitrogen stayed the same. Oh my gosh! And that's because nitrogen cannot be used by the body in the form of nitrogen. It needs to be uh, fixed for us. But the carbon dioxide increased to about four. The, carbon dioxide, uh, the oxygen decreased to about 16. And the water vapor, well, saturated means as much as it could possibly handle. Um, the test for carbon dioxide, as some of you may know, is lime water. You bubble it through lime water, it goes from clear to cloudy. Um, I have no idea why this, that, this one is there. Give me a sec. Okay, so um, you have a regular breathing rate or your resting breathing rate. Um, if you begin to exercise, and that's just a quick way to do it, you'll notice that you'll breathe deeper. <sighs> and then you'll breathe faster. So your breathing rate increases due to exercise, and that's because um, as the CO2 content in the blood increases, or lactic acid, the blood becomes more acidic. 
the brain has some sensors that says, oh dear Jesus, my blood is turning into acid. So it tells the breathing muscles to breathe more. And hopefully, once the CO2 lowers, the acidity changes and the blood becomes more neutral and the brain tells it to stop again, all right? So you can technically force yourself to breathe faster by injecting yourself with acid. I'm not saying do that, I'm just making a point. Okay, so moving on to excretion is the removal of toxic materials and the waste products of metabolism and substances in excess. So excretion is getting rid of stuff that your body made. Or, yeah, your cells, I should say, made. Um, you need to be able to identify kidneys, your readers, bladder, and urethra. So kidneys lead to your readers. They connect to a bladder. Urethra is the, is the tube to the outside world, all right? And inside the kidneys, you have your cortex and your medulla. So you need to be able to label maybe your, the, your, the ureter. Inside each uh, kidney is billions and billions of the rock fans. No, uh, these things called, uh, technically it's a nephron, but they call them tubules. And your tubule does the two-stage kidney process. Stage one is filtration. And the way kidneys work is the same way you clean your bedroom during spring cleaning. Take everything out and only put the stuff that you want back in. So at this point, the Bowman's capsule or the renal capsule uh, Everything diffuses from the glomerulus into the uh, capsule. So water, poison, salt, sugar, everything diffuses out. Then during the, uh, the ascending and the descending loop, the good stuff is sucked or absorbed or actively transported back into the bloodstream. And all the bad stuff is left to be collected and gotten rid of, okay? so. The syllabus explains it, or it says that you need to um, outline the function of a kidney tubule, renal capsule for filtration, and the tubule for reabsorption. So the capsule is where filtration takes place, and the tubule is where absorption takes place. All right? Um, we already went through the fact that the liver breaks down um, drugs, hormones, and alcohol. Good one for hormones. And it also breaks down excess amino acids into urea. Uh, the kidney's job is to remove excess water and urea from the blood and to reabsorb glucose and some salts. So that's straight out the syllabus. And we need to get to dialysis. Now dialysis, oh, this is a great slide, Neville. Dialysis is what you are going to have. Well, what happens if your kidneys aren't working properly or don't work at all? And it's basically a blood cleansing machine. Uh, the blood goes out, and is pumped out into a machine that has dialysis fluid, and the dialysis fluid, you know, absorb. Or yeah, technically they absorb all the stuff that needs to come out: the urea, the excess salt, the excess sugar. Shouldn't be any sugar there afterwards and then it puts that clean blood back in okay so instead of dialysis you could just get a kidney transplant there are some positives and negatives to kidney transplant versus dialysis as you can see from my slide I know exactly what they are use your brain downside to kidney transplant there might not be a kidney downside to that dialysis it sucks you know go for it have some fun um, advantages and disadvantages done Tan, last one, we're almost there, people. Coordination and response. So we start with nervous control, and the nervous system is made up out of two parts, the central and the peripheral nervous system. So the central nervous system is where coordination takes place, and the peripheral is where body functions are pro, um, controlled. So think of it like a coach and a team. The team is the peripheral. They're the ones that do all the work, but the coach does all the important thinking. Okay, and then you win the Super Bowl. So you have voluntary versus involuntary reactions. Uh, the definition for those are pretty much as you would expect. Hold up. And here we have a table, voluntary versus involuntary um, actions. Voluntary actions are ones that you can control. Involuntary actions are ones that you cannot control. You, you don't think about, it just happens. 
Um, so you do not really control your eyes adjusting in the light. It just happens, okay? Examples, there you go. Now, for some reason in the, in the coordination topic, you need to be able to label an eyeball. Um, there are too many labels on this one, so go through your syllabus and make sure that, where is it to? You can label the basic parts of the eye. Where are we to? Can't find it. So uh, maybe we can just find it in the textbook and make it a lot easier. There you go. This is a better picture. This is straight from the, the, uh, the textbook. So you need to be able to label the parts of the eye um, and say where the uh, rods and cones are. So rods and cones do two different things. Um, so the cones are responsible for color vision and they're, I don't like this picture, they're around the fovea, all right, and they respond to high intensity light. And then the, the, uh, the rods are distributed kind of everywhere else and they are responsible for seeing with low level light, not so much the, uh, the color. Okay, so fovea is where all your cones are. The rest of the sc the, uh, the retina is where the <coughs> the rods are. And remember, the cones are responsible for color and high intensity light. A um, few points to note: the image that you see in the eye is upside down. Your brain flips it over for you, and your brain controls the focus of objects that are close or far away by adjusting how thin your lens is. And that process is called um, accommodation. And then it also allows, the brain also controls how much light goes in and out by opening and closing the iris. And that's the uh, pupil reflex. And we'll go through that in a sec. So let's look at the uh, pupil reflex. When the light is bright, the pupil contracts or gets smaller, and when the light is dull, the pupil relaxes and opens up. And that's because there's a circular muscle around it, and there are also muscles right there that go lengthways, but let's deal with the circular ones. And that controls the, uh, the pupil reflex to allow light in and out, okay? So the pupil contracts and the iris covers more of the light, and vice versa, just like a camera. All right, so there's your two different types of muscles, ones that go around, and when they contract, they make the hole smaller. And then the other option is these ones relax, and the long ones contract, making it open up wider. Okay, so there's your um, little table, I guess. And then you get the accommodation which is what forces our lens to be stretched into a ball, sh well, squished into a ball shape or stretched into a, a thin shape. And that's due to suspensory ligaments and ciliary muscle, okay? So when the ciliary muscle is relaxed, it's big, all right? It's really wide and it pulls my lens thin. When my ciliary muscles contract, it shrinks, just like this guy, when he contracts, it shrinks, and that forces my lens to go to its regular shape of, uh, you know, a ball almost. I had an experiment where I used a water balloon with tape on it. It never works, so. So there's your table to figure it out. When you want to see distance objects, your lens is thin, the ciliary muscle is res relaxed, and the ligaments are tight. So the ligaments are pulling your lens nice and tight. When you have something close, the lens is thick, the ciliary muscle is contracted, so the space is smaller, and the ligaments become loose. Okay? Kind of weird, just make a little table and watch it more once or twice, maybe YouTube it if you need to. Um, there's another view of someone else's uh, notes. A mnemonic for you, ciliary muscles contract for close vision. So that could help you. You need to remember one. The uh, 
the opposite is just the opposite. Almost done. We get into a simple reflex. So a simple reflex skips the brain, all right? Something senses, so you have sensors like touch sensors on your fingers. It goes through a relay, and then it goes to a motor, which makes movement happen. So let's look at stipping your finger on a pin. The sensory neuron sends the electrical impulse up to the relay, which pushes it into the motor. And all of that is that electrical impulse. S there is no brain involved. You will move your finger before you even know that you've stuck your finger on the pin. Okay? And that's a reflex action. Reflex actions are automatic, and they, they integrate um, stimulus with response. So bright light, eyes closed, automatic, nothing you can do. Um, muscles and glands can be effectors or responses. So you're used to your muscles being a effector, but glands can also be an effector when an electrical impulse hits a gland. So if I put a taser to your mouth, you'll start to secrete saliva. Um, Please note that some muscles are opposite to each other and they're called antagonistic. And what happens is when one is contracted, the other is relaxed. And if I want the reverse movement to happen, I have to contract the other one and relax the other one. Oops. Okay? So when I want my bicep, when I want my arm to raise, I contract my bicep and make it shorter. And I relax my tricep and the arm moves up. If I want my arm to lower, I contract the tricep and relax the bicep. Now, hormones, please note this definition, especially the end part. Chemical substances, ultraactivity, destroyed by the liver. Okay? The hormone they want us to deal with specifically is adrenaline, but there are other hormones. We have uh, the pituitary gland makes you know, growth hormone and all that type of stuff. The pancreas makes insulin and glucagon. Ovaries and testes makes estrogen and testosterone. We got all those. All right, but we're dealing with adrenaline. Um, so what adrenaline effectively does is it increases the amount of sugar in the blood. And that increase in the amount of sugar should increase respiration. It's our fight or flight hormone, okay? So when adrenaline is secreted, our liver cells turn glycogen into glucose, our heart starts to beat faster, our pupils get wide, we start to breathe faster. Our arteries get thicker, so that more wider, sorry, so that more blood flows through. And less blood flows to the uh, stomach. There's no time for digestion when you're running. So situations where adrenaline is secreted, when you're frightened, when you're angry, when you're excited, um, when you're being mauled by a bear, when there's snakes on a plane, when you're going super saiyan, when you, yeah, okay. So the difference between the nervous system which is you know, what we just spoke about, and the endocrine system, which is hormones, are these. Nervous system uses nerves, hormone, endocrine uses glands. Uh, nervous system uses electricity, endocrine uses hormones. Uh, the hormones are transported by the blood, where the electrical impulses are transported by the neurons. Endocrine is slow, nervous is fast. Endocrine is long-lasting. Um, the effect of adrenaline is a lot longer than a nervous impulse. Nervous impulse means I move my hand away and that's it, I'm done. Um, whole body versus localized and many results versus a single result. Okay, um, hormones in food, oh, good job, buddy. Um, BST, so BST, bovine somatotropin, is a hormone that is made by cattle and it's to try and increase milk production, okay? Now there's a problem with people and hormones and food and making animals extremely huge and all that jazz. But BST, BST is the one that uh, was used. It's been banned in some parts of the UK, but it's still used in the United States. Uh, geotropisms are responses in which a plant grows towards or away from gravity. If it's a positive geotropism, it'll move towards it. If it's a negative geotropism, it moves away. Phototropism is a response where the plant grows towards or away from light. And both of these are present in growing plants. Uh, roots show positive geotropism, and shoots sh show positive phototropism. Now, how does this happen? For the roots, auxin, 
which is a hormone produced in the shoot in the tip, um, is affected by gravity. So what happens is the oxygen starts to move toward the bottom or the flat side, and as a result, oxygen in a shoot stops growth, which means the outside grows faster and it starts to bend down. Think of a boat engine. If I suddenly shut off one engine, the boat will start to turn. Okay. Now, oxen in a chute is a little different. In a chute, the sunlight destroys the oxen. And in a chute, oxen promotes growth. So it makes the plant grow faster. And as a result, well, it causes elongation. Um, as a result, the plant bends upwards. All right? So in chutes and in roots, There you go. So um, weed killers, the way they work is they block oxen. Um, the problem is you can't really tell weed killers who and what to use. Um, or other ones, what they do is they cause the weeds to grow too fast, and then the weed ends up just dying because it can't keep up with its growth. So. We can use oxen to kill weeds because it'll make the weeds uh, grow too quickly. And then they'll die. Are we done? I butchered this entire thing. No, we're not done. Homeostasis. Almost there. The maintenance of a constant internal environment. Okay, now there are a bunch of things that we need to maintain in the body. Big one is temperature. Um, in order to do that, we can build up lots of layers of fat or if we're cold, we do what is called vasoconstriction. We shut off the blood supply close to the skin so that less heat can escape. If we're hot, we do the opposite. We increase the blood supply through the skin so more heat is lost through radiation. Um, and that's why we go red when we're hot. Um, we also sweat, and what sweat does is it evaporates off the skin and it leaves behind the low energy molecules to cool us down. The next one is about sugar levels. If we have too much sugar, the pancreas releases a hormone called insulin, and that tells the liver to turn glucose into glycogen. We learned that already. If we do not have enough sugar, the pancreas releases glucagon, and that tells our liver to turn glycogen into glucose. So we already learned the first part, now we just know the name of the hormones. Please note they are made in the pancreas. So again, Insulin turns glucose into glycogen. Glucagon turns glycogen into glucose. Lots of words that look the same. Make sure you can spell them. Um, negative feedback, when the output of a system changes or decreases the input of the same system. So here's an example of negative uh, feedback. Baby cries. You jingle your keys. Baby stops crying. So that seems like a positive outcome, but it stopped. So it went backwards. We went from crying to not crying. Um, positive feedback keeps increasing the input. Baby cries, daddy shouts, baby cries louder, daddy shouts louder, baby cries louder, daddy shouts. See, positive feedback causes it to uh, continue and continue. Drugs are any substances that modify or affect chemical reactions within the body. Um, so we use drugs to kill bacteria because what they do is they, the drugs interact with the enzymes or something to do with the bacteria and cause them to die. So basically bacteria have cell walls, so they're in little mini houses inside of our house that we call our body. What we do is we use antibiotics to destroy them. Um, viruses, on the other hand, they do not have their own house. They come and they move in. The only way to destroy a virus is to burn down the house because it's the same house. So you cannot use antibiotics or the same mechanisms to get rid of um, bacteria or infections as you can with a viral infection. Okay, um, heroin and its effects, alcohol and its effects. Okay, let's get into that slide and be done. So heroin is a depressant. It's very addictive, and it's easy to overdose on. Depressant means it slows everything down. Okay. Alcohol is also a depressant. Um, yes, it can relax the body, but 
too much slows everything down and you're just they're gonna want you to talk about how heroin and alcohol can be a problem there's a list for you hit pause and write it down if you want here's another one hit pause write it down if you want 